Thank you, Daniel, and thanks to our, our team has done an amazing job this past week. You know, along with all the things that were going on with having camp, uh, we were also going through a lot of things with people in our congregation, around our congregation, some of them joyful and some of them uh, really sad and heartbreaking. Uh, Peggy, who, um, Grable, who runs our facilities and does such a wonderful job, and we all love Peggy. Um, her mom went home to be with the Lord in Iran, and so uh, we experienced that, and I'm so thankful that uh, when she got that news that she was here at church and there were the people around her uh, to be able to love on her and to be able to encourage her, but you can imagine go through the loss of your mom and not be able to, to be there because of the political situation uh, that she would be facing. And so uh, praying for her. And uh, then there was a, a wonderful family here in our community, uh, Dr. Keith West. Uh, he's a plastic surgeon uh, here in Marietta. And uh, his wife uh, passed away. And um, they asked for our church to be the church and for me to do uh, her service, which I was honored to do. They're really close friends uh, here with the Elrods and uh, with the Page family. And so uh, our staff uh, got this place turned around because they were here at 5 o'clock uh, with Windshape, and then Windshape had to take down all of their stuff, and there were just people all over this building. Uh, Andre Downs uh, was was here from morning till night, and there were just so many people pitching in. And then there were our folks like, uh, you, you know, uh, our members who went the extra mile all during the week and then showed up on Saturday to be host and hostess um, for the funeral that uh, took place here. And our church just did such a great job of ministering to that family. And um, then while that was going on, uh, for our former uh, assistant worship pastor here, Josh Coots and Madeline Fan, who was on our staff for a number of years, uh, they were married. And uh, Daniel Roberts did uh, the wedding. And of course, Matt was in the wedding and Mary Margaret. And so uh, they had all of that that was going on. There was just so much uh, that was happening. But man, our team handled it with grace, and Jerry and Marjorie Cox in particular, it seemed like I was seeing them constantly. They are representative of uh, so many of you who volunteer and make this church such a great church. It just yeah, made me very, very proud of you. And then Daniel uh, getting to do uh, Josh and Madeline's uh, wedding. They have no idea that Daniel has never been ordained, and uh, so probably going to be a shock to them in a couple of years, but uh, that's just the way it goes. No. Uh, and now uh, I want to recognize a group of people. Uh, you know, a lot of you come to me, and it's interesting. I never used to experience this, but uh, even people going on vacation now will come up and say, hey, would you pray over us? And uh, you know what? That's a privilege and an honor to be able to do that. And I did that with a young couple uh, this morning uh, that's leaving for Italy. And uh, we have a team of people. We have 13 people who are joining 17 people from the great Brentwood Baptist Church up in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, they're going to be going over to Brazil to do the medical missions uh, that this church is now involved in its 15th year. Uh, Jim and Marianne Elrod have done a, a marvelous job of stewarding that group. Uh, they're going to be leaving on Friday night, June the 30th, and they're going to be returning on Saturday night, July the 8th. They've invested so much of their own money, uh, plus this church certainly uh, tries to help uh, them as well to go. We help to try to buy some of the medical supplies, other things that they're going to need, and uh, they're going to be joining Pastor Douglas in uh, Costa Barros. He's been pastoring there for over 20 years, and uh, they go into a very tough area. Now, I don't mind telling you, it's caused me concerns before because I always want our people protected. I always want our people to have safety, and uh, we want to pray 
pray for that safety uh, more than anything else. So I've already prayed for some of you uh, that were in the early service, but if you are going on this mission trip, would you please stand at this time and remain standing for just a moment? For those of you that are going on the trip, here we've got a group of people. We are so proud of y'all this morning, and we love you. And I want to I wanna pray for you right now, all right? Lord Jesus, as these missionaries go out from this church, God, we pray that you would bless them in all of the work that they're going to do, from the medical clinic with the pharmacy to an eye clinic to be able to help people struggling with vision, and Lord, most importantly, the evangelism team where the gospel is shared with anyone coming into that clinic before they even receive their care. God, we pray for each segment of the team as they go. Thank you for our friends at Brentwood that we've partnered with for so many years to be able to go down. Also, Lord, we pray that you would uh, bless Pastor Douglas as he receives this team in, as he's held forth in a very difficult area. And they've been a light, and they've been a a gospel marker for that community. We're so thankful for him. We're so thankful for that church. So God, now I pray your traveling mercies on the team. I pray, Lord, for airline reservations, for getting to hotels and meals and all of the different things, and then travel back and forth every day as they make their way over to the church to be able to share the gospel and to be able to meet the physical needs of people. Jesus, you told us that if we give as much as a cup of cold water in your name, it's as much as we've literally done it for you. God, bless our team and bless all those that will join with them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank you. So, we're continuing in our summer reading series. I'm really excited about today's message because today we're going to be taking on the Gospel of John. And for those of you who might not have been here over the last few weeks, what we're doing in the summer reading is that we're taking a book of the Bible. Uh, we're kind of put, and I say we because Daniel's also been preaching in this series, and we've been taking uh, maybe our favorite passage or maybe it's our favorite verse or or perhaps it's a, a concept that's taught in that book that's really kind of the central theme of the book. And so today, uh, we're going to be taking a look at the Gospel of John. And what is really interesting about John is that the writer John tells us his purpose for doing the entire book. Uh, he states his purpose this way. It's in verse number 30 and 31 of John chapter 20. He says, so many, many, uh, so then, there are many signs that Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples which were not written in this book. But these, talking about what is there, but these that have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, when that word shows up Christ for us, uh, that's the same word in the Old Testament that would be Messiah. And so the Jewish people have been looking for their Messiah. And John is declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. And he goes on and defines him even more, the Son of God. And then he tells you the purpose for the Gospel of John. And that by believing, you may have life eternal life in his name and that eternal life begins in this world when you make your profession of faith now A.W. Tozier said about the gospel of John he said the gospel of John illustrates what it looks like when God the Son comes to dwell among his people and John's gospel profoundly shows how God's Son Jesus makes it possible for us, all of us, to have an eternal relationship with God the Father. So I want to talk to you about eternal life. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture that's absolutely perfect for talking about eternal life in the book of John. And it's in John chapter 3. 
Now, for those of you that have been around a long time, you've heard me tell a lot of stories over and over. Just indulge me and don't tell me you've already heard this before. But uh, I was a brand new Christian and uh, had not yet gone on a church staff, uh, but was feeling a call to the ministry. And uh, our youth minister had left us and gone off to seminary. The pastor was going to the Southern Baptist Convention, and it was the week of Vacation Bible School. So it was right around this time of year, and they asked me, if I would preach my first message and I would do it on a Sunday night when we were recognizing all the children and their families that had been a part of Vacation Bible School. How many of you in here grew up going to Vacation Bible School? Can I see your hands? All right. So you know what that closing night is like because uh, all the kids want to do is take their parents and show them if they built a birdhouse that week or whatever they did. They really don't want to hear a preacher preach. And imagine for me, that's my first time to preach, and this is the angry crowd that I've got to deal with because all the kids are in the, you know, the worship center and everything, the little church building. And so that night uh, I preached, and again, I was brand new to faith. I did not grow up going to church. I had not heard all these Bible stories that some of you have heard. And so when I would hear a story or read a story, I would get fired up. And uh, I got so excited about this story that I'm going to share with you today in John chapter 3 because it talks about a man uh, who was a Pharisee and his name was Nicodemus. Have y'all ever heard of that guy in the Bible? And so I preached about Nicodemus all night long. At the end, someone came up to me and very gently said, Ike, it is Nicodemus. It is not Nicodemus. Man, it looked like Nicodemus to me. I mean, I was, I was absolutely sure. And, uh, you know, now, you know, I've got an education, got my, my degree from Mercer, got my master's, got my doctorate. If I mess up a name like that now, I'm a lot more educated. If someone corrects me, I just tell them, well, that's the way you pronounce it in the Greek. And uh, they... They walk away thinking, I know Greek. I don't have the foggiest notion what Greek really means. So, you know, Nicodemus here is going to come to Jesus, and he, he's a Pharisee. And so a Pharisee was a part of one of the ruling religious bodies. And so their government was made up in a different way than our government is today uh, because you had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you had the high priests, you had a group of people called the scribes, and all of these people went together. Now, they all believed different things, you know, like the Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection of people, but the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And the way you can remember that from now on is they were Sadducee because they didn't believe in a resurrection, right? And so these were the ruling people. And so the Bible tells this interesting story about this night with this man named Nicodemus. Now, by the way, when I preached that first message that night, at the end of the service, when I gave the invitation, there were four young ladies who came forward and accepted Christ that night. Uh, because God was a lot more interested in whether or not I believed his word and whether I could pronounce his word appropriately or not. And it taught me a valuable lesson that I've carried down to today that if I would just be faithful in the preaching of God's word, I can just leave the results up to him, right? So there is this man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He's a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. Now, some people have criticized him and said, you know, this is Nick at night. He's coming at night because Nicodemus doesn't want anyone to know that he's there. Or maybe Nicodemus is an extremely busy man, and maybe this is a moment that Nicodemus can carve out. But he's there at night, and he comes to Jesus, and he's very respectful. I want you to know this. this. He says, Rabbi. So he's immediately establishing that Jesus has a group of people that are meeting him, and he is their rabbi. We know, talking about these religious leaders, that you have come from God 
as a teacher. He's still trying to figure out exactly who Jesus is in the great scheme of things. He's saying, now, we, we know that you're a great teacher because we've heard you teach, but for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him and said, and you'll notice he uses a phrase, truly, truly, or in the King James it would say, verily, verily. But you would do the double there to create a sense of emphasis. So Jesus is saying, listen real close. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, years ago, when Jimmy Carter was president of the United States, he made a statement that he was born again. And it caused a furor in this country. It was as if some people had never heard that phrase before, that you had to be born again. And Jimmy Carter was, of course, talking about what we call conversion Christianity, that you are converted, that you come to Christ, that you repent of your sin, and you embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You take what he did on the cross. You believe uh, if you only believe in the cross and you don't believe in the resurrection, I don't think you're going to make it into heaven because the Bible says if we repent and we believe that he rose again, then God is going to bring with those, uh, those of us who know him as our personal Lord and Savior. But when Jimmy Carter said this, it just caused a furor, and then it caused a series of books to be written, and all of a sudden, people were using this phrase, about being born again. And then Jesus is saying to him, I want you to really, really listen, barely, barely. I want you to really, really listen. Unless you, Nicodemus, are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what they have been waiting on. They have been waiting on a Messiah. The Messiah would usher in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is gonna teach us something remarkable here because the kingdom of God is not just when you die and you go to heaven. The kingdom of God starts at the moment in your life that you embrace Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because right now Jesus, according to Scripture, is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. And as he's seated at the right hand of God, when you and I embrace him and we've asked him to come into our lives and forgive us of our sin and we have repented and we've turned to God, at that moment you and I are also seated in the heavenlies with Jesus. That's why that we don't have to fear when we die because we already have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't just kick in when you take your last breath here. Your eternal life starts the moment that you ask him into your heart and into your life and you truly believe that he is your salvation. And no one is ever going to get to heaven without making that decision because it's all about what you believe. And no one can believe it for you. Your spouse can't believe it for you. Your children can't believe it for you. And baptism is not what saves you because there are some denominations that teach that unless you're baptized, you're not saved. To me, being baptized is just simply, you know, an outward sign of an inward change. It's a very important first step of obedience after you embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But being baptized is not going to save you. You, you know, you, you can be baptized once or twice. You can be hosed, dunked, and dry cleaned. That's still not going to get you to heaven. It's embracing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And you say, and sometimes I witness to people, are you a Christian? Yes. How long have you been a Christian? Tell me a story. I've been a Christian all my life. No, you haven't. You haven't been a Christian all your life. And you say, how do you know? Because the Bible teaches us that we were born in sin, that we were born with a fall, that there had to be a remedy for us. 
And that remedy is what Jesus Christ does on the cross, and God's stamp of approval is what he does when he raises Jesus Christ from the dead. So, you know, just because you were born in a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian any more than if you were born in a garage, it would make you a Ford, okay? So it has to be a personal decision that you make. So Nicodemus is baffled by this statement. Nicodemus said to him, he took it very literally, how can a man be born when he's old? You're telling me I've got to be born again? Well, I'm an old man. How am I going to be born again? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Ask it back to Jesus. And Jesus answered, he comes back with that double again, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, water, is water. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. And then he uses this analogy. He says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from and where it's going, and so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? I, you know, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And then Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and, and you don't understand this? I mean, Nicodemus, you, you're a very bright man. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we've seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, then how are you going to believe about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven. Then Jesus uses the title that was his favorite title to describe himself the Son of Man. And then he takes him back to the Old Testament. And listen, I know there's varying views and varying thoughts today uh, about the Bible, and, and there are some people, and I get sometimes what they're saying. There's a lot of hard things to understand in the Old Testament, and they'll almost say, well, just don't even worry about the Old Testament. Just worry about the New Testament. Well, you know, Jesus referred to the Old Testament. That's all that he had. But he refers to it here, and he refers to a story. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And you say, I, what in the world is he talking about there? Well, when Moses was trying to get the people out of Israel, or out of Egypt and into Israel, there were fiery snakes and serpents. The people were rebelling. The people were angry. And so when all of that was going on, these serpents came in and started biting people. And God said, Moses, fashion a, a bronze replica of that serpent, and you put it up on a pole, like a flagpole, and you lift it up, and everyone who looks to that will be saved. Everyone who looks to it will be saved. And so the Son of Man, he said, has got to be lifted up the same way. Now he's prophesying that he's going to die on the cross so that whoever believes in him is going to have eternal life. So Nicodemus, th this is the deal. And then he comes down to the verse that we know and that we love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, begotten is huge right here that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for god did not send his son into the world to judge but that the world might be saved through him so let me hit a couple of things here with this and just give you a couple of thoughts what's the truth 
uh, about eternal life? Well, the truth about eternal life is that Jesus says that all of us can have eternal life. And so he has this courageous conversation with Nicodemus. Nick came at night maybe because uh, he didn't want people to know that he was there. But maybe he came at night because he was so busy. But he came with a sense of urgency, and he also comes in with a sense of respect, and they have a courageous conversation. And you know, the most courageous conversation you will ever have is not with someone else, but the most courageous conversation you will ever have is the one between you and God, whether or not you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ lives in your life. That's a conversation. I can try to lead you through a conversation to help you experience conversion in your life. But at the end of the day, it's that conversation that you have with God. And if you notice up through verse 15, there's direct discourse. Jesus is teaching, and he's teaching all of these different principles. But in verse number 16, it becomes transitional. And now he's talking to Nicodemus about his own personal life. Look, God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, meaning you, believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Nicodemus is shocked by this, but it's conversion Christianity. We believe that we can lead people to Christ and that people can be born again. And so Nicodemus, you know, he, he's thinking just in practical terms. Now, what he's experiencing here is what we would call the doctrine of regeneration, the doctrine of being born again, the doctrine of how do you come to know God and actually have a personal relationship with God. And the way that you do that is through believing. And so Jesus then takes Nicodemus back to the Old Testament and said, you remember when the serpents bit everyone and Moses had to fashion the bronze serpent and he held it up so that everyone who looked and believed in healing would be healed? And Nicodemus would have certainly known that story. So in John 8, 28, Jesus says about this passage, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing on my own, but I say these things as the Father has instructed me. Now, the passage he is referencing, if you want to look it up later, is Numbers chapter 21. Uh, I'll read verse 9. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and he put it on a flagpole, and it came about that if a serpent bit someone and he looked at the bronze serpent, then he lived. And so Jesus is teaching us there, then we have to look to him. He's going to be lifted up on a cross. Do we believe in what he's doing on the cross, that it's for us, and will we embrace his resurrection from the dead? Now, the synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are really the synoptics, and John kind of stands on his own. Because if you go to John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so we, we know that Jesus was in a unique position, that Jesus was not a created being, that Jesus has always been. And that's why that word where it says his only begotten son is so very important. Now, I don't know Greek, but I can read about it. And the phrase in Greek is mono, meaning one, genes. So literally translated, this is my one and only, this is a one and only situation. Uh, you, you remember when Abraham was told by God, take your son, your only son, your only begotten son, and take him and sacrifice him? Now, think about it for a moment. Did, um, did he already have a son, Abraham? Yeah. 
You remember Sarah couldn't conceive, and Sarah was bitter. And so in an effort to be able to take things into his own hands, Abraham had relations with Hagar, his wife's maidservant, and they had a son, Ishmael. That's why if you talk to people of the Muslim faith, they're going to tell you they believe in Father Abraham. They're going to also tell you that they understand that it was Ishmael that he took to be sacrificed and not Isaac. Because they would say, he said, take your only son. And if Ishmael was born first, that would have to make him first. Unless you understand that this begotten is what's so important here. Because God was saying, I want you to take the son in the covenant that I established with you. And in that covenant, it was Isaac and it was not Ishmael. And so when the, the word is used here to describe Jesus, it's describing him as a person who has no beginning in time as the only begotten son. And it's important that, that we remember that. So uh, if you look this up later and, and you want to get even more ideas about it, it's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, where the writer refers to Isaac as Abraham's only begotten son. Sadly, some translations just say son. And they, they don't use the word there for begotten. And so people will say, well, see, Jesus is not equal to God because God created Jesus. No, Jesus has always been and he'll always be. He's co-equal with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So those things are vitally important. So let me kind of wind it up here. Our eternal life is set into motion by believing. And no one else can believe for you. It has to be you. You're the one that has to make that de decision in your life. And it comes down to belief. I mean, that's what all of it comes down to, is it, it comes down to belief. Those who believe and those who do not believe. And according to Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will believe be saved. So the New Testament formula for eternal life is you believe, you repent, and then you receive eternal life in him, Jesus. It's the centrality of Jesus Christ. And the cross, man, anytime a young preacher talks to me about preaching, I always tell him, make a beeline for the cross, you know, get to the cross because that's where it's all summed up. And so we're told that we then have in John 3, 16, eternal life. And the way it's positioned linguistically is that it means present possession, present possession. You have eternal life right now. So you and I do not die with a condition over us. We, we don't die with a condition over us. Uh, we know that our time on this earth is limited. Uh, yesterday, when I did the funeral for the West family, and uh, what a remarkable family. Uh, they are best friends with the Pages that are part of our congregation. Dr. Page was my physician, uh, when I had my heart attack, and he helped me to stay on this earth, for which I'm eternally grateful. Uh, but um, this family, you know, you, your heart ached, but they, they knew she got to live for 64 years. But you know what? 64 years is not enough. And 74 years wouldn't have been enough. And 84 years wouldn't have been enough. Because when we love people, and they're going to be separated from us, it's hard for us to conceptualize that they're only get, going to be gone for a short time on their end. And so I, I, I quoted this verse. I, I didn't go into it, obviously, uh, in, in a funeral. But here's, here's the deal. When you and I get to eternity, when we go to be with the Lord and we step into eternity, we're going to lose all reference to time. And so I quoted this, and it was 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, 
And a thousand years is like one day. One day is like a thousand years, but yet a thousand years is like one day? Yeah, that means that you're not bordered by time there. And Psalms chapter 90 verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it just passes by or a watch in the night. And see, you know, for Miss West that went to be with the Lord, for her, I mean, she's only going to be there a few moments. And she has three beautiful children. Her husband's amazing. Um, she's only going to be there a few minutes. And she's going to turn around when they come in because there's, there's not a time factor that's there. The rhythm of night and day will have ended. I, I love it because it says there's no more night there. Robin will tell you, I hate sleeping. I only like to sleep. I sleep maybe four or five hours a night because I'm afraid I'm missing out on something. And when I think about, wow, there's no more night, there's no more night in that place, and we're going to be able to be there. And we're going to be with him eternally in that place. Well, man, what's eternity like? I heard someone years ago say, it's a great visual. Imagine an eagle, a majestic bald eagle coming down. And he's over there at Stone Mountain. And he just kind of comes down and he just kind of dips and tips his wing. And he comes by and he just brushes it on the top of Stone Mountain. In the time that it would take to wear that stone monolith away, stone mountain, eternity would just be beginning. Wow. Eternity. And it says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We all can be saved. He takes away the sting of death. He gives us eternal life and I shared uh, with Dr. West yesterday just on a personal note in, in the service uh, when I lost my first wife and I didn't explain all of this Dr. Nelson Price called me I was still at the hospital and he said something uh, that was so profound he said I she's the only person that ever loved her more than you and I told that to Keith and to the family yesterday. Your wife, your mom, is the only person that ever loved us more than you guys would. The sending of Jesus is the big idea in Scripture. The last point. It's the big idea in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Most of us right there, we think that's the most important verse, but maybe, ju just maybe, theologically, verse 17 might be bigger. And here's why. John 3, 16 is implied throughout Scripture that God is out seeking and saving us. And at the end of the service today, we'll sing that, that song about, you know, how relentless he is to find us and to love on us. And, and it's not just that God loves the world, but in verse 17, it says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world would be saved through him. See, the world has been judged since Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell. And that's why that's so theologically important. Jesus didn't condemn the world because it was already condemned. And in John 3, 18, the one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe in him has been judged already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Wow. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he cares for us. Colossians 1. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And through him to reconcile all things to himself. Whether they're things on earth or things in heaven. 
He's made peace through the blood of his cross. And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body and his flesh through death in order to be able to present each one of us before him, God Almighty, as holy, blameless, beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which was proclaimed in all of creation in heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. God's our friend. He's not our enemy. He's for us. He's never been against us. And he wants us to experience his fullness in our life. This is a judgment. The light came into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. See, when you and I do bad things, God brings that into the light. And he says, for everyone who does evil hates the light. In other words, they hate the truth because they know what they've done. And they may lie to you and they may fool you and they may fool everyone around you. But let me tell you something. You are not fooling God. You are not. Everyone who does evil hates light and does not come to the light so that deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices truth, he comes to the light so that his deeds will be revealed of having been performed and wrought in God. I'm thankful today for eternal life. I'm thankful that I know that when I breathe my last breath that I'm going to find myself before God. And I'm not going to be by myself. I'm going to have Jesus. I'm going to have my angels. I firmly believe that with all of my heart. And listen, none of us are getting out of this world alive. None of us. None. So why not be sure? Because here's what I know from an old preacher that invested a lot in my life through his preaching. Jess Henley. He said, eternity is too long to be wrong. So if you're not right today, let's make it right right now. Let's pray. Father, I pray for people today that are sitting right here under the sound of my voice. And they will have no excuse when they stand before God one day and they have to share what they did with Jesus. What did you do with my son? Did you believe? Did you embrace him? Or did you just walk away? So God, today I preached a message about as simply as I know how of what it means to be born again. To turn from our ways and to turn to God. And listen, you may have been baptized. You may have joined the church. It would be a lot of things. But if you say today, I, I need to know that I know that I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die, then I just want you to pray this prayer silently. Just pray it in your heart. Just say, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life. I'm feeling convicted. And I want to have confidence. So Jesus, I believe that you were born of a virgin. I believe you lived a perfect life. Therefore, you could die the perfect death for me on a cross. Just tell him that. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. And I'm asking you to come into my heart to save me from my sin and to grant me eternal life. And then just say to him, help me not to be ashamed of you, Lord Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm looking around. If you say today, hey, Ike, I prayed that prayer with you, and I'm not ashamed. Nobody's going to come get you or bother you, but i like to pray for you. If you say, I prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up real high? And then right, thank you. Thank you. All the way down here in the front, up through the middle, I see you right there. Yes, sir. Over to my right. How about the balcony? Thank you. Wow. Number of hands raised this morning. You know, maybe today 
you'll want to come down and just thank the Lord for saving you. If you need to talk to me or Marlon, we're always down here at the front. Just come down and let us know. We'll be glad to meet you, Daniel, all of us. But if you want to come kneel and pray today, that's a wonderful thing to do. Maybe you know some people that need Jesus today. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's a grandchild. You want to come kneel and pray for them today? You come kneel and pray. God is relentless with the way that He loves us. Allow Him to lead you home today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.